Thank you. So, am I supposed to start now? Yep. <laughs> uh, thank, you. Uh, th uh, thank you. Thank I, I hope people speak English because I speak zero Korean. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, uh, this is a talk that has evolved a little bit from my uh, so-called Nobel lecture that I gave in Stockholm. Uh, and the first two-thirds of it uh, will be about kind of the work that I did, most of which was all done 50 years ago. It took them that long to figure out that it was worthwhile. Uh, and then the last uh, third of it is some more recent observations that I have made. Uh, so uh, that I show you just how confusing this really is. So let me. Uh, Oh, and by the way, my, uh, see if this, uh, uh, okay, yeah, there we go. Uh, my, my website, johnclauser.com, uh, has all of the references in here uh, free for download if, if you would like to uh, get, need copies of, of them. Okay. <clears throat> Let me start out with describing what is quantum and, uh, entanglement. Way back at the beginnings of quantum mechanics, uh, Schrodinger produced Schrodinger's equation, as we've all, all heard. And actually, he produced two equations. Uh, the first one was for uh, hydrogen for a single particle system. Hydrogen has only one electron. And then he uh, produced a second equation for helium, which has two electrons. So we had two different equations, for a, first one for a single particle systems and uh, one for uh, systems with more than uh, one particle. The two particle, uh, the first one seemed very reasonable and people so, could sort of understand it. Oh, uh, showed we had wave motion uh, uh, in, of matter waves. Uh, the second one was uh, had for two particles was uh, of, had some very surprising properties. It had a, it, the solutions had, up to the equations had a whole new uh, property that nobody had expected, which was called quantum entanglement. Okay, uh, Schrodinger uh, invented the word uh, quantum entanglement to describe this. The wave function for a pair of independent particles is a simple product of uh, the individual wave functions of the two individual particles. The wave function for a pair of entangled particles is, in general, a sum of products of the wave functions for the two individual particles. Two entangled particles then exhibit intimately uh, correlated behaviors. Do I have, are we sure we have the right? So, all that has to happen is, so, is if you have two particles and if they ever interact with each other, uh, even slightly, they, they, they become entangled. Okay, so what is non-local uh, entanglement? This is uh, somewhat, this was the most surprising part. Within a helium atom, the two electrons are intimately buzzing around each other in, in close uh, proximity, so it would be hardly surprising if their, their behaviors were so, uh, not somehow correlated with uh, each other. On the other hand, Einstein and Schrodinger both observed a very peculiar uh, feature of quantum, mechan quantum entanglement, that the particles became, were, had this intimate correlation uh, with each other no matter how far apart. They were. You could separate them, and they still had this very 
uh, intimate uh, correlations with each other. This disturbed both of them very, very badly. They couldn't understand how that could be, that they could still be apparently in communication uh, when they were widely separated. So, in 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen wrote a very famous paper that proposed uh, the addition of additional variables in quantum mechanics. They proposed that quantum mechanics was really an incomplete theory and that we needed some new variables inside the theory to explain this uh, intimate correlation. And, Then there were two other uh, people, uh, actually Schrodinger and Wen uh, Wendell Fury, who was in, at Harvard. They both came up with this hypothesis that, well, maybe something's wrong if you take the two particles uh, when you separate them, then maybe something's wrong with the quantum mechanics a little bit that this intimate, uh, the entanglement effectively disappears with, uh, with separation that, that, that isn't there. But then they realized if they did that, then the predictions of quantum mechanics would be, uh, would be different. And they said, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, quantum mechanics uh, always makes the correct predictions, and it certainly does for helium. So that's got to be wrong. So they simply uh, dismissed it. Niels Bohr had more mystical, if you will, description of how this uh, cor correlation uh, occurred. Uh, I never really understood uh, Bohr's uh, arguments, but nonetheless, uh, the, he claimed that no, Podolsky-Rosen hidden variables were not necessary in order to uh, uh, explain entanglement. And there was a major debate between Einstein and Niels Bohr, and I will assert that it was never really fully resolved. Probably one of the reasons I didn't understand it. <laughs> okay, so again, why do we need it? Well, you, you, you need entanglement just to explain the spectrum of, of, of helium. Uh, and that simple fact uh, was overwhelmingly uh, sufficient to convince nearly everybody that uh, local entanglement is, is a necessary component of quantum mechanics. Now, my work started in 1969. Uh, prior to that, uh, nobody ever suggested, well, maybe we ought to actually do an experiment to figure out uh, is this really true? This, this is so bizarre. There was one exception to the nobody. Uh, it was Bohm and Heronoff. They looked at the uh, schrodinger fury hypothesis uh, in 1957, and they realized that an experiment that had been done at Columbia uh, by Madame Wu and Ivan uh, Shaktoff in 1950 had uh, basically disproved uh, Schrodinger and Ferry's uh, uh, suggestion. So, what is a Bell inequality? Okay, there are actually uh, most. Uh, there are really three of them. Uh, the 1964. John Bell looked at Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen's. And he made a, a, a totally brilliant, totally unexpected discovery. Uh, that Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen's argument led to, to uh, ex the, the, the addition, with the addition of hidden variables, led to exactly the opposite uh, result that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen had intended. Uh, that is, that the, it, this also changed the quantum mechanical prediction. They wanted putting 
hidden variables in to explain the correlation. In fact, if you put hidden variables in, you couldn't have the correct correlation. But like everybody else at that point, uh, Einstein, uh, Schrodinger, Bohr, Bell assumed, well, of course, quantum mechanics always gives the correct predictions. So no experiment was performed. Then in 1969, I collaborated with Mike Horn, Abner Shimoni, and Dick Holt. And we real looked at this argument, and we concluded, gee, something, maybe somebody actually do, ought to do an experiment. This, this suggests that, OK, there might be a different prediction. Well, it turns out you couldn't uh, get a prediction from Bell's original inequality. But we reworked the inequality and came up with a, a new inequality. And that uh, is the uh, CHSH inequality. And it makes a very specific prediction, which is different from quantum mechanics. Uh, we did not, obviously, assume a priori that the quantum mechanics always gave the correct predictions. We also looked at some of the important loopholes. I will discuss this further. So then in 1974, uh, Mike Horn and I were looking further into what all of this really meant uh, and found that it's, this was a, went way beyond just Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen's hidden variables. And we proposed a new experiment and a new inequality. OK. Let's go back and, and look at each of these. Okay, so 1964, this was John Bell's uh, first inequality. So th they assume, as I said, uh, everybody, EPR and Bell, all assume quantum mechanics made correct predictions. With, with the, uh, ironically, Bell's pr prediction produced the, just the opposite result. It was extreme irony. Uh, Entanglement implied an incompatibility between predictions of quantum mechanics and uh, quantum mechanics with additional hidden variables. The intimately correlated behaviors of the two particles uh, governed by quantum mechanics cannot be explained by the introduction of hidden variables. Okay, the 1964 uh, inequality, unfortunately, uh, Bell had assumed that th there had to be uh, a particular experimental uh, con uh, or, uh, configuration, uh, orientation of the, uh, the polarizers or the analyzers that led to a perfect correlation. Well, uh, there, you could, there's no way you could build uh, a, a device with perfect correlations, so the, there's no way you could actually use his result to do an uh, with, to provide an experimental test. So that's where Mike Horn, uh, Abner Shimoni, and Dick Holt uh, came in. We produced uh, the uh, uh, Fizrev letter in 1969 titled "Proposed Experiment." We we did exactly that. We proposed a specific experiment. We, design, we uh, designed it, uh, all provided, uh, uh, oops, there we go, yeah, we designed all the, the necessary details uh, for doing the experiment. And what we did was we, we found, we looked at Bell's original inequality and found that his requirement for some orientation with perfect correlation was not necessary. You could re-derive the result, leaving that out. You got a different inequality when you did that. That was the CHSH inequality. Uh, so we uh, formulated the, uh, a new inequality, C the CHSH inequality, uh, and not, oh, leaving out this uh, particular, this, uh, impossible to, uh, to achieve conditions. And so now, we're in a marvelous position. We have two theories. 
quantum mechanics on one hand and the CHSNH inequality based on assumption of hidden variables uh, being present. We got two different predictions. Let's ask nature. All right, let's, let's do an experiment and find out which one is true. It could be neither one, but uh, we didn't know. Uh, but at least we have two different predictions and we can now have a very specific test to do it. There were a few little minor tricks about the, uh, with the detector efficiencies, or with probably, uh, being outside the light cones of each other, minor details. We made some rather simple assumptions that, that to get around those. Uh, and so we produced a protocol, an additional uh, set of steps in order how uh, you could uh, 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 still do a conclusive, uh, reasonably conclusive experiment. Okay, so then in 1974, Mike Horner and I were wondering, uh, well, is that all that this uh, Bell's, the generalizations of Bell's inequality uh, really constrain? And realize that no, it's actually it's far more powerful. We, uh, so we created what's called uh, the theory of local realism. Uh, it's an extremely general theory. Uh, I will describe it in detail later uh, in the talk. So it's a major generalization of hidden, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen's uh, original local hidden variable theories. In the process, we generated a new inequality, the CH inequality which is, allows, gets rid of all these extra loopholes uh, requiring uh, additional protocols. This one, if you, if you violate it, it it's dead. Uh, and local realism is dead if you violate the, uh, uh, and I will get to that later. So if you re re add all of the various uh, earlier uh, Minor, uh, some extra assumptions, then it reduces back to the CH and SH inequality that we produced uh, in uh, 1969. Uh, it was very tough, it, it specified a very tough experiment to do with technology in 1974, it did not exist to do that, but it has since been uh, tested. Okay, so, uh, I thought this is really f important stuff. Everybody else thought I was t totally nuts in proposing all of this. So I went out and succeeded in uh, 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 rather difficult uh, to do, but I finally could uh, convince uh, of people at UC Berkeley to let me actually do some experiments to test this. Uh, so in 72, published the first experimental test of uh, any Bell inequality in particular, in this case it was the, the, the CHSH inequality, this 69 equality. Uh, Is the computer in this uh, have the right registration? That we shouldn't be having this wraparound of the, of the, at least the lit, not on my slides. I'm not sure that, it's, uh, that the PowerPoint is set up correctly, but <laughs> it's a little distracting. But I'll, let me continue. Uh, okay, um, so then in uh, 1976, I did a second experiment. There was a conflicting experiment, I'll get to that. Uh, and I went even further and looked at different kinds of polarization. And then in between, uh, it wasn't really part of this. It was only peripherally related. I did another experiment, which was the first test uh, that demonstrated the photons actually have a wave particle duality, that the photons uh, be, uh, 
have a particle-like character. Surprisingly, uh, that had never been tested. Okay, let's go back to the, the, the first of these. Okay, this was a 1972 experiment, Friedman and Clauser. Uh, Stu Friedman was a graduate student uh, at uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, working for Gene Cummins, uh, his thesis advisor. And he and I worked together and built an apparatus from scratch. We really didn't have any money to do this, but uh, we, we struggled and did a lot of the machine work ourselves, wired, wired the whole thing up, and built this whole kludge here on the, on the uh, oops. Uh, okay, in the right, okay, this is Stu Friedman here, standing, uh, very young, in 1972. This became his PhD thesis uh, work. Here we have a pair of polarizers. On either side. These are pile of plates polarizers, really large. In the middle, we have a, an atomic beam apparatus to produce a uh, beam of a, a calcium vapor. Uh, it's very corrosive. You can't put it in a bulb or anything. It'll, it'll etch the, the walls. Uh, so we measured the linear polarization correlation of photons emitted by the calcium beam flying out in opposite directions. Uh, the, uh, they were producing an atomic cascade of calcium. So we have three levels uh, of calcium. We excited it to the top level, it decays to the middle level, decays to the bottom level. In the process, uh, each decay produces one photon and only one photon. And they fly, fall out and they get detected in uh, photomultiplier tubes here, another one over, the, over here. <clears throat> the thing that really made this experiment very difficult was tunable lasers had not yet been invented. So to excite the uh, calcium uh, atoms, uh, we had to use this very weak discharge lamp from uh, deuterium discharge uh, and filter out everything but the necessary light to excite the atoms. It, was, it uh, made the data collection rate very, very slow. So we had to, uh, uh, to collect data for over 200 hours, which actually lasted over several weeks to keep the, because they had to refill the oven many times and the whole series. So it was, it was a very tedious experiment. But then, nonetheless, we found a 6.3 sigma uh, violation of the CHSH inequality, saying hidden variables are prohibited. And there was a there was this, a, a protocol uh, that, to get around the uh, needed auxiliary assumptions. Okay. In the meantime, Dick Holt, he's the last H of CHSH. He and Frank Pipkin uh, uh, at Harvard were doing a competing experiment. They got the opposite result. <laughs> so they decided, gee, you know, we don't really trust our results. Well, let's wait and see what Berkeley did. So when we announced our results, published those in 72, Holt and Pipkin decided, no, I don't think we're gonna publish. Uh, but now I was, sort of uh, feeling awkward. Uh, Stu Friedman uh, got his degree, went off to Princeton, but now I was worried, well, did I make a mistake? Uh, did we make a mistake? Uh, maybe I better re repeat his version of the, of the experiment. They used a mercury source, uh, so I spent a lot of time with Dick Holt learning how to uh, build the mercury sources that they used. Uh, and he was very generous and, and helped me. Uh, and so, so we use, uh, I, I used a, uh, a mercury 202, it's a separated isotope, 
mercury, you have to get rid of all the nuclear spins. There are, uh, I don't know, half a dozen different uh, isotopes of, of mercury. Uh, and so you, I happened to find a vial of separated isotope of uh, 202 and grabbed that and built these, these sources. Okay, the way you did that was that you had mercury vapor in a sealed glass tube uh, and you had an electron gun. Actually, this was kind of a, a uh, pulled out of a, uh, a cathode ray tube. Uh, and so it's a rather complicated structure, but nonetheless, that excited the mercury uh, atoms and again produced uh, cascade photons. Uh, so I used, reused at least the, the, these rotating coffins here. Uh, I had to gut and re replace all the mirrors, have more mirrors. These are, were, these are uh, pot, what are called pilot plates polarizers, the whole series of very thin sheets of glass, uh, Brewster's angle that were reflecting uh, out uh, unwanted polarization. And nonetheless, I got uh, a violation of CHS inequality now for the second time uh, by more than four sigma. Okay, and again, use all of the, 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 the protocol tricks of CHSH. While I had it, the uh, thought, gee, you know, this is a unique opportunity. So, and they still let me stay on a little bit longer at Cal before my welcome ran out. And so I put in a pair of quarter wave plates and now uh, in each of the sides and remeasured the circular polarization. Uh, totally uh, independent uh, uh, test. Okay, in, bet in between those two experiments, I was wondering, well, what else could I have done wrong? One of the extra assumptions that had been made uh, for the, these auxiliary assumptions was that the photons behaved like particles, localized lumps of something, whatever they were, perhaps the electromagnetic field even. Um, that the photons had to behave like particles and be either reflected out of the uh, beam at, by the pilot place polarizers or, or not. Well, it turns out this, the assumption that there was a wave particle duality or that, that there were actual uh, particles uh, behavior of photons had never actually been tested, surprisingly. Now, where did this all come from? 19, Einstein, in 1917, when he was trying to understand thermal e equilibrium between a gas and black body uh, thermal radiation, the question, would they all come to the same temperature if they were interacting through uh, 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 interaction between the, the photons in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, black, in the black body radiation or, or not? He, he realized that phot photons effectively had to exist. What he actually, what he called directed energy bundles. And to what he, it is a very famous paper in which he realized that the interaction between uh, atoms and light required three independent processes, absorption, uh, emission, and stimulated emission, which is what you need to build a laser. And this is the paper that uh, introduced all of this in this very famous Einstein A and B coefficients. So, these, and the, the photons had to be emitted, uh, received as directional energy bundles, so he called them. Now, Schrodinger looked at this, and he said, well, they could be coming out like, sort of like needle, they call, they call it needle radiation. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that they're actually particles. It still could be wave-like. What is the necessary difference between waves and particles that one could test? 
he came up with a great idea that if you have a half silver mirror and you put a, one of these direct energy bundles through it, if it was a wave, Maxwell's equations propagating, telling you about the propagation of a, of a wave pulse, a, a short pulse of light, if you will, that some of it will be transmitted and some will be reflected. On the other hand, if it's a particle, and you send out one and only one photon, it will be either transmitted or reflected. Very different. So, what he suggested was, suppose you have a, a beam splitter or half silver mirror, and you put two photodetectors, photomultiplier tubes, one on the transmitted beam and one on the reflected beam, then if the photons behave like particles, you will never see coincident detections in the, in the two photodetectors. Uh, if it's a, uh, a wave, then you will sometimes see, because uh, some is reflected, some is not reflected, so you will see uh, the two detectors will sometimes simultaneously register. So he is in Vienna, he goes down the road to Budapest, not that far away, and he talks to uh, Janice, Janice in Budapest, and suggests actually doing this experiment. Unfortunately, uh, Janice did not have available single photon sources in order to do this, and he also made one major mistake uh, that uh, grossly overestimated the detection efficiency of, of the uh, phototubes. He left out the solid angle factor. So I decided, well, gee, I better repeat uh, the Adam Yannese uh, Varga experiment and asked, well, is there some way I can make that experiment totally conclusive? Uh, he just kind of had a, a set an upper limit, and so I decided. Well, so what I what I found was I looked at some recent uh, studies by Roy Glauber, uh, who was studying the uh, statistical properties of classical electromagnetic pulses of light, uh, and I said, oh, this is very interesting. And I fiddled with a, what's called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in mathematics. And I realized, gee, if you do this experiment twice on a, the cascade photons that we were, uh, were using for the Bell Serum experiment, you could make a fully conclusive experiment. So here we have this is a source, and the first photon would come out uh, in this direction and either be de uh, detected at this phototube, 1A or 1B, the second photon come out through this half uh, silver mirror and be detected by the 2A or the 2B uh, photomultiplier tube. And what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequalities uh, provided was a very nifty uh, experimental prediction. That is, let's just assume that the particles are waves. Well, we need them to be uh, uh, particle-like for, uh, in order for the Bell theorem test to work. So, so if they came out as a, as a, uh, a wave, then say for this photon, this detector and this detector would both simultaneously have an anomalous uh, coincidence count. And the same thing would be true for this, for the first photon in the cascade. Uh, but so what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality tells you is that the product of these two anomalous rates, which is supposed to, be, each one is supposed to be zero, it has to be greater than these coincidence rates. Well, these coincidence rates are between this detector and that detector. Well, that's just what we were seeing or uh, measuring earlier. That's the, the, the photons in the cascade. That's got to be there. So this is a very strong uh, uh, test. So I did that, and the data here show that the, that 
with, by overwhelming statistics that we have particles. Uh, photons are acting like particles. Okay. I mentioned local realism. When Mike and I, Mike Horn and I, were trying to understand all this, we were wondering, what all does this really constrain? In the process, we invented what we called then uh, uh, objective local theories, is what, uh, the name we originally gave it. Uh, we later uh, uh, had a series of uh, papers, uh, including uh, John Bell and Abner uh, Shimoni, and we renamed the whole theory uh, local realism. Local realism is a, an extremely general theory. It's a, really a, 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 it's a huge generalization of the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen's uh, hidden variables. And it's essentially the whole platform for Einstein's uh, space-time approach to physics. So, we formulated the details of local realism. I will go to give those in a second. Uh, but we, uh, to make it fully general, we, found we did not in need to worry about causality. Uh, uh, it was, uh, and we've, uh, the, the, we did not need to uh, automatically assume that uh, uh, we had a particle-like behavior. So the, the interesting property was the friedman clauser experiment that we had done early, two years earlier, had already refuted this theory. It was literally dead on arrival. That uh, the, the, so the earlier experiment said, sorry, <laughs> nice theory, but it's wrong. Uh, so, but that was, well, it was still interesting because one of the additional things was that it got rid of the loopholes that were for the hidden variable series. So a lot of people thought it was worth testing. So let's, let's talk about what does the theory of local realism assume? Well, it's so general, and one of my co-laureates, Anton Zeilinger, commented, if Bell's theorem and local realism had been uh, uh, invented before quantum mechanics, it was, it's so reasonable that everybody was just, just declared it a law of nature. What does it, it assume? It assumes that nature is made out of stuff. We, maybe we don't know what the stuff is. But whatever it is, it's somehow distributed throughout space. Uh, give, to give it a name, uh, actually, we were really talking about the same stuff. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen called it elements of reality. John Bell, in one of his papers, he called it local beables, stuff that, okay, we called it obje objects, objective local reality. Right? The uh, cosmologists call it matter. The Bible calls it a light mingled with firmament. A lot of people assume, yeah, there's stuff out there. Whatever it is, we don't know what it is, but you, stuff you can put it, you gotta be able to put it in a box, surround it. Okay. Uh, now, some of the other theories, like for example, general relativity, assumes that there's stuff there. They go make much more detailed, uh, uh, the general relativity makes much more detailed demands on the stuff and say, well, it's got to have a mass density and energy density. We don't care. It doesn't matter. We, general relativity and Newtonian physics all assume that the stuff uh, has a deterministic evolution. We don't care. It could be uh, totally 
stochastic or random evolution of the stuff with time. As to quote Einstein, God could be playing dice at every point in space and somehow uh, screwing up the evolution of stuff, uh, uh, of the stuff uh, randomly. So what we assume is whatever it is, you could surround it and put it in a box, very big box perhaps, uh, uh, but the stuff has, must have properties. And the, uh, when you're doing an experiment, the uh, experiment you do is somehow measuring or interacting with the, the stuff that's there. That the property of the stuff, they don't need to actually determine the result, but the assumption is that they, uh, at the very least, the stuff that's there, the properties of the stuff that is there, physically there, determines the probabilities of the experimental results. Really weak uh, requirement. We also wanted to get rid of all this extra mysticism that God introduced along the way. For example, in Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger introduced the, the cat paradox uh, kind of as a reduction to absurdity if, argument. The problem was that people took the absurd to be true. So we said, okay, whatever happens in, a, in an experiment, we're going to, even if you don't look at the results, we assume that they are definite, they exist. So Schrodinger's cat is either alive or dead uh, inside the box, but we just, uh, whether we look at it, we just may or may not know the fate of the cat. Okay, let me go back to what's a box. The box is really very simple. Uh, it's a s closed surface. Uh, mathematicians refer to this as a Gaussian surface. Gauss, a very clever mathematician, uh, proved, and I don't really know how he did it, uh, that there exist closed surfaces that separate space into two mutually exclusive volumes. They're called the inside and the outside. A box has an inside and an outside. So here we have, say, where's my pointer? Oops. Okay, here we have a, uh, 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 oops. a, a pair of boxes. Uh, pointer isn't behaving, okay. Uh, and each one uh, has within it a, 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 a someone generating the uh, a parameter setting. It's got a an apparatus that's measuring something. We don't know what it is, but during some time interval, uh, you will get a. The apparatus will give you a binary result, yes or no. We have a second box, separated from the first box. Okay, these two characters now are called Alice and Bob. They, uh, I made this slide back in 1976, before I knew what their gender was. Sorry. Okay, so the, here we have, to make this a four-dimensional box, uh, these boxes are shrinking at the speed of light. So if they're in this configuration, the measurements are being made uh, outside of each other's light cone. Well, here on the right-hand side is uh, the two light cones uh, surrounding the boxes. The boxes are, are shrinking with time. So any correlation between the results of the two experiments was all due to stuff back here in, in the overlap region of the backward light cones. Okay, so what does local realism uh, actually uh, uh, predict? So we have two widely separated boxes Okay, we, we, we need one more important assumption. 
Okay, remember we had, each one of these apparatuses had a, uh, a, a an adjustable parameter here. The man is turning a knob and this man is, is turning a knob on the apparatus and setting an adjustable parameter. The assumption is that the parameter set, setting made in one box, if it's set very far away from the other box, that the parameter setting made in, uh, in one box cannot affect the results of the, uh, of the experiment performed in the distant box. Okay, so this is effectively uh, saying that the, there can be no light travel signals propagating between them, that they can't interact, and this is eliminating what Einstein referred to as spooky action at a distance to the, as for explaining the correlations. So, surprisingly, what I've said is, I think, really very simple stuff, very reasonable stuff, but the great surprise is that that alone is what all you need to make an experimental prediction. That uh, prediction is the Clauser-Horn inequality, 19, we published in 1974. So, uh, it was impossible to test in 1974 given the state of the technology, uh, but since then it has been tested and convincingly proved uh, wrong. Theory of local realism is dead. But it, to do so was very difficult. It took a lot of people and a lot of money uh, to, to do that. Fortunately, the willingness of people to spend money uh, dramatically increased in the intervening time. And the two, gro two groups simultaneously uh, tested it. The first time, they did it, they were not out, uh, outside of each other's uh, light cone, or vents uh, were called, that's, or uh, space-like separated. Uh, the first group was, was at uh, uh, okay, uh, was at the, uh, Anton Zeilinger's group in Vienna. And the second group was Paul Quiat's group in Urbana-Champaign, uh, Illinois. Then the same gr uh, two groups, uh, two years later, each uh, uh, did, did, uh, redid the experiment where they actually did have space-like uh, separation uh, of the uh, two boxes. So, this whole basic platform of studying space-time uh, physics, uh, the space-time formulation of physics is dead. <laughs> this bothers me very much, <laughs> especially because I helped in killing it. Uh, let's see. Missing a slide here. Um, what is one? What does this say? One of the you could ask a simple question. What is the simplest possible object or piece of firmament, if you will, uh, that is definable? The simplest, very simplest possible piece of firmament or object is a single bit of information. So what does the well, death of local realism uh, say? We'd like to believe we could take one of these simplest objects, this bit, and put it in a box. Even better if that box happens to be our own personal computer and sitting on our decks. We would like to be able to put a bit inside that box and know that it's inside the box. 
Is that always possible? No, it is not. What the death of local realism says that there exist bits, they're now called qubits, quantum mechanical bits, and that they that can be distributed over uh, two or more boxes. So if you want to uh, determine the value of the bit, uh, you need to perform experiments on both using uh, locations on, in both boxes. You can't do it just by looking at one of them. So uh, that fact is, has, is very important uh, and forms the basis for what's now quantum cryptography. Okay, let me move on to my more recent uh, uh, observations. Okay. I've been still struggling to try to understand what does all this mean. And in the process, I, over the years, I collected a large number of quantum mechanics textbooks. And I noticed there were two totally independent schools of thought. Uh, the, the, and this is the fact that they existed was what I will refer to call an elephant in the room that's been hiding in plain sight. And it's been hiding in plain sight for 80 years, at least. Nobody except me, as far as up till now, seems to have noticed this fact. So, but what, once you start paying attention to what the demise of CH local realism uh, uh, says, it becomes pretty obvious. And these two different formulations are actually mutually incompatible. So the, the two schools, uh, the first school essentially is a form of local realism, and therefore it is incorrect. Okay, so what happened was the einstein podolsky rosen uh, the Einstein-Bohr debates had never really been settled. Each one had fostered authorship of a whole a set of textbooks, the other another set of textbooks. Many of these textbooks you probably may have used. Uh, and some of you, after you walk out of this room with your buddy who studied at a different school, gee, which one did you use? Oh, gee, oh, gee, I, I used the other one. This is the, the, the grand surprise to me. Okay, the first uh, school number one. This basically follows uh, Einstein and Schrodinger's mode of thinking. <laughs> the first such textbook was by Max Born, the earliest I could trace it to, uh, 1933, second edition in 1935, and then finally the, an English translation uh, came out in 1969. Uh, very popular book uh, I used when I was an undergraduate, Dickey and Whitkey. Uh, Dickey was at Princeton, was used there. Uh, and then others, Heisberg, Isley, uh, in between. Feynman wrote a very famous review article laying what he called the foundations of space-time physics. Remember, localism essentially has gotten rid of space-time description of physics. Uh, Another very important book was by French. I uh, used that also when I was an undergraduate. And French and Taylor uh, wrote a very nice uh, quantum mechanics uh, textbook, used at MIT uh, in 1978. Uh, another important uh, uh, textbook that uh, very popular was by uh, Mertzbacher, 1961 and 1970, two different editions. And one of the early, very important books that people used a lot uh, was by Schiff uh, at Stanford. Okay. They f 
School number one formulates quantum mechanics in what I refer to as laboratory space. What's laboratory space? Laboratory space is the space we live in. Like, for example, this room. There are three coordinates one could place, x, y, and z. If you specify the value of x and y and z, you specify a unique point in this laboratory. It's the world we live in, and it, there are only three dimensions. You can't add any more. Now, a very important uh, a requirement for lab space, it doesn't need any system associated with it. The, uh, it doesn't have to have any particles in it, uh, waves, nothing. It just need, it's just there. It's the, the platform in which uh, the players will play, if you will. It has uh, standard geometric properties that we learn in vector analysis. Uh, very important theorems of vector analysis, Green's theorem, Gauss's theorem, Stokes' theorem, they all specify essentially the structure, the geometry of lab space. And again, there's, there is a, a vector, R, what I hear, use uh, for our lab, where is it? where's my pointer again? Okay, that specifies a unique point in the lab. Okay, so what does school number one specify? It specifies a wave function, psi. And it's, that wave function is a function of position. So, uh, so here we have, oops, uh, here we go. So, psi uh, is the wave function, and we also have a probability density, psi star psi. That is, uh, it, the, the value of this wave function is complex, but psi star psi is a very real number, and it specifies the probability density of, of finding a, uh, a single particle at, a uh, at that point, our lab. The, okay, and here, this psi is a just like any other field. It's like the electric field, it's like the magnetic field, it's like the pressure uh, distribution for, uh, for, for creating sound waves. Okay. Its evolution is governed by a wave equation, in this case Schrodinger's equation, written in lab space. All sounds very reasonable. That's why we all loved those textbooks. They were very understandable. Okay, it also, uh, okay, if you multiply psi star psi times the mass of the particle, that gives you, and you have a beam of particles, this gives you the mass density of the wave, uh, or of the beam uh, at any point. So it sounds very wonderful. Uh, Born also defined and echoed in all these other textbooks what's called a conserved probability current. And he, most of these textbooks even talk about this as a current of particles flowing. Okay, it also has uh, a, this, a wave-like property. So you've heard a lot of people describe quantum mechanics as describing waves of probability pro uh, propagating. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Why? It only works for single particle systems. It's essentially a form of local realism. Okay, so what's the other school of thought? That was, follows the teaching of von Neumann and Bohr. Okay, it has its own uh, following of textbooks. All of these are very important textbooks. Uh, they're, to some extent, uh, referred to as applied quantum mechanics textbooks. Uh, one of the most important ones 
here uh, is a beta and saltpeter. This is the standard reference on the structure of hydrogen and helium. And it goes into great detail, takes all of the various quantum electrodynamic corrections, etc. cetera. Uh, it is a marvelous, uh, a marvelous textbook. Uh, the, another one is Bjorken and Drell, actually a two-volume set, relativistic extension, relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, and relativistic quantum fields. Uh, another very important one is Conan and Shortley. It describes the quantum mechanics of atoms with more than two particles. For, for in general, atoms in in the and it's also if you want to learn matrix mechanics, this is a great place to look. It's also. Uh, uh, if it has a marvelous uh, section on how to interact atoms with light. Uh, Dirac's book, uh, also very important, uh, Beginnings of Relativistic Quantum Mechanics, Landau and Lifshitz. This is a very famous book. Landau was uh, a student of Niels Bohr. Probably one of the most important ones is Messiah, it's quantum mechanics. Uh, textbook. One little problem with Messiah's book is that he's a little bit wishy-washy. He says very clearly he's working doing quantum mechanics in configuration space, except he doesn't always uh, obey the rules and sometimes reverts to lab space. Pauling and Wilson, uh, that's where most of the chemists all learn their quantum mechanics, and the granddaddy of them all was by von Neumann, a mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. The, uh, so, so, what is configuration space? Configuration space is a totally abstract mathematical space. It's got any number of degrees of dimensions in it, or what they call dimensions. They're not dimensions, actually. They're what, they're what is referred to as degrees of freedom of the system. It was originally introduced for Hamilton Jacomi classical mechanics. Uh, and von Neumann's book, that's just even further, he takes configuration space and he generalizes this into Hilbert space. Even harder to understand. Uh, the, but unlike lab space, this is a very important distinction is you need a system to be associated. For example, if you want to have two electrons, a system. That defines the number of dimensions or of, of parameters or degrees of freedom. Remember, lab space didn't need any systems at all. So. What is, what is uh, uh, configuration space wave function look like? Well, this first formula is right out of uh, uh, von Neumann's book. It depends upon degrees of freedom of the system. Uh, Schrodinger's equation is show, it's a wave equation propagating in this fictitious space. Okay, so if you have two particles, what does the arguments of the wave function look like? Well, it's got a uh, position of particle one, spin of particle one, spin of par position and spin of particle two. That formula is right out of York and Drell. But now we have more than three dimensions. We have an x, y, z for particle one. So it clearly cannot be lab space we're talking about. And if you tried to put in lab space, add, uh, then you can't do this and still obey the rules of quantum mechanics. So there's no specific point in lab space where uh, the wave function is uh, this configuration space wave function is evaluated. Uh, it, that means it has the same value everywhere. 
That means there can be no probability waves propagating in the lab. The way in lab space we had very understandable, believable waves. Here they're gone. How, how is this possible that we had these two different schools? The tricky bit was that Born produced what I will refer to as Born's uh, ambiguity. He, in his book, uh, and publicly apparently in lectures, said these two spaces are the same. Gee, they sure look the same. They both have an XYZ in them. Uh, but they are not equivalent. Very different spaces. Correspondingly, there are no probability waves in uh, configuration space. Dickey and Whitkey and Merzbacher both noticed this fact with great alarm, but that's as far as they got. So, uh, and importantly, the uh, n-particle Schrodinger's equation uh, in configuration space does not reduce to the single particle wave function. It should, but it doesn't. Uh, okay. Uh, so, but we got to have it because you need configuration space in order to get entanglement. We know that in, now, especially with uh, the Bell's theorem tests, that it's, it's absolutely necessary. But, but if you want to be consistent, then the, what, for, if you let n equal one for an n particle system, you've got to have your wave functions still stay in the configuration space. Okay, it's not without its own problems. Okay, first off is that all of these neat uh, uh, properties we had, Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, etc., cetera, uh, Gauss's theorem, there's no reason that they should apply. Uh, that also means that you cannot construct these Born's nifty conserved probability currents uh, that he introduced to, in order to guarantee uh, flux conservation in Rutherford scattering. Okay, uh, von Neumann points out some difficulties. It's not, uh, configuration space is not relativistic uh, invariant. Okay, we, for it to be properly relativistic, the invariant is, okay, we have an x, y, z for uh, each particle, but to be relativistically correct, we would need an x, y, z, t for each particle, and each, because each particle has its own clock. And if the particles are moving very fast, their clocks under special relativity are advancing at slightly different rates. And in fact, when you try to go to solve a relativistic uh, situation for, say, highly ionized helium-like ions, that the particles are moving very fast. The equation that's supposed to describe that is the bright equation, and it is not relativistically invariant. And Beta and Sal Peter, in their book, say, gee, you know, we're the, there, there are problems. We really don't know how to solve this. Okay, what does this mean? Well, how do we understand quantum mechanics? Well, I personally have the faintest idea what it means to have a wave propagating in a configuration space. This is abstract mathematical space. The, we can't have the conserved probability currents and I'm not alone in saying that this, uh, you can't understand it. Dickey and Whitkey and Merzbacher and Einstein, obviously. Was, so, this difference now shows uh, what the real problem with, that Bohr and Einstein were encountering. They were simply talking past each other. That uh, Bohr was assuming configuration space. Einstein was assuming lab space. They all both mistakenly bought into Born's ambiguity. 
And so it explains the, the difficulties that uh, Einstein was having. It's a totally uh, 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 abstract space, uh, but there's no prohibition for propagation of, of signals faster than light in this fictitious space, because there is no space there. Similarly, uh, uh, wave function collapse, uh, part of the measurement problem, disappears. Okay, the final quandary, I'm running short on time, but uh, is in unif that one gets unsolved problem in physics, how does one unify quantum mechanics and general relativity? Uh, you can't. One of the, and one of the reasons, I strongly suspect, that one of the reasons is that general relativity is uh, written in lab space, whereas quantum mechanics is in configuration space. It is, no one seems to know how to, to construct general relativity in configuration space. What are the degrees of freedom of the universe? <laughs> A lot of them, obviously. Can you make constructs like black holes work in quantum mechanically? Can you quantize the spins of black holes? Can you do a Bell's theorem? It's tests with uh, black holes beats the hell out of me. Thank you. <웃음> 그럼 <웃음> 지금부터 문답 시간을 갖도록 하겠습니다. 그 되도록이면 우리 저 젊은 학생들이 질문을 많이 할수 있으면 좋겠습니다. 우리 클라우즈 박사님께 이제 평소에 묻지 못했던 질문들을 뭐 하면 되겠는데요. 저 영어로 하셔도 되고 우리 말로 하시면은 앞에 계신 최만수 교수님께서 이제 통역을 해 주실 거예요. 그래서 부담 갖지 마시고 그 클라우즈 박사님께 여쭙고 싶은 말씀 있으면은 뭐 지금 뭐 물을 수 있는 좋은 기회가 되겠습니다. Uh, hello, Doctor. Uh, I'm Yusin, a uh, uh, master student. In Professor Juno lab, and first of all, it's really huge honor to hear your lecture. And thank you for giving a wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, I don't know what to uh, experiment of uh, inequality theory, so it will be a very simple question. And what does the mean of uh, what does the mean the sigma in the re re result? Okay, sure. what, and what is, is it better to what, have a smaller one? What was the question? Yeah, you, you said that um, the CHSH inequality is violated by six sigma. Six point three. Yes. That's, and and what that's, is, in, the, that's what, in this nineteen seventy two experiment. Yes. That's right. So her question is, what is sigma? Sigma is uh, <laughs> standard deviation. Uh, of the, the points, uh, oh. the, the, uh, the, the total spread of points about uh, that you, uh, you can calculate is proportional. It's basically one over the square root of n uh, for, uh, for, the, for the measurements of the, of the difference between uh, the quantum mechanical prediction and the CH inequality. Uh, limit. How far apart were those? Are those two uh, uh, values? So, and, and how statistically accurate is this? Six point three. Okay, the standard uh, it set in physics uh, is five sigma, which should mean a probability of error of uh, ten to the minus three or four or something. Uh, in, uh, probability of, of it being but uh, Alvarez at Berkeley kind of set that standard, five sigma for, uh, for physics. He used to say three sigma, which is supposed to be the order of 97% probability. He said, ah, that means 50-50 to me. So the physicists are very strict on the probabilities. 6.3 is very tough to beat. So we, I think it was very, we were very confident in the results. Uh, yeah. Good. Thank you. So, 
뒤에 하얀 옷 입은 남학생. 예. Uh, hello, actor. Uh, before I start my question, uh, it was a great honor to hear your uh, lecture, and thank you for your uh, lecture. Uh, it, um, uh, comparing to the previous questions, my question can be quite uh, on the, uh, general, but uh, as I am a business student, uh, I was wondering, uh, how do you think uh, your, uh, your uh, lectures and or your uh, studies uh, can be adapted in our real world? Uh, for, uh, and yes, I was curious about how can, uh, it can change our real life or our future. Um, good question. Actually, I am not the expert. This uh, uh, quantum uh, career conference is kind of addressing exactly that problem. Uh, and okay, I just Hello. I just did the science. I really don't. Sorry, sorry. can you speak oh, to I'm the sorry. mic? Oh, I just yes. did the science. I don't really know much about the, the potential applications. The primary application I mentioned there was, can you put a bit in a box? Uh, and that gives you uh, quantum encryption immediately for, for doing that. Uh, the, the whole conference of uh, Quantum Korea is addressing uh, what all the various possibilities are of coming out of this, especially from in, uh, entanglement, uh, is one of the possibilities that they're uh, looking forward to. The only real application I can think of at the moment for of quantum entanglement research is for quantum encryption. Thank you for answering that question. For example, the, the, that's in practice today uh, using the, the Chinese have a quantum key distribution satellite, MISIUS, that is currently flying. Uh, and in fact, the configuration that the MISIUS satellite uses is almost identical to the, that of the Friedman-Clauser experiment. The, the source is, happens to be a satellite, and the two uh, photo detectors are now ground stations, so the scale is dramatically different, and they can talk for uh, to receiving stations that are a thousand more than a thousand kilometers apart for quantum encrypted uh, communication between the two ground stations. That's one uh, important uh, application of the work. Uh, does that? Answer your question, or and I don't know about the others. Yeah, I have to ask the other people at the conference. Thank you for answering my question. 자 질문이 많으실 걸로 생각이 되지만 시간 관계상 딱한 분만 더 질문을 받고 마치도록 하겠습니다. 아, 이 앞에 있는 까만 옷 입은 남학생, 예, 거기, 예, 좀 마이크가 요요앞 여기 있는 요 까만 옷 입은 남학생. Uh, I'm really interested uh, to hear your lecture. Uh, um, I have a question that um, can we trust uh, your um, physical uh, 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 so uh, what I want to say is that um i i wa i was hard to replicate uh, many experiments in physic uh, physics science for example newton's double slit experiment um i'm not still uh under i cannot understand uh um Newtonian physics verb, uh, and even Einstein was wrong. Uh, it appears that Einstein was wrong, yes. <laughs> I think I, I, I'm not sure I fully understood your question, but. Uh, so. Can, uh, can you help me? So, uh, Kronika, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I Okay, if, if what I did was doing the experiment, I didn't know what, what result we were going to get, uh, but I, mean, I, I was hoping that Einstein would be right. Uh, <laughs> but 
that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, that was why, the, in fact, I even had a few side wagers on that. But I didn't know what the result would be. Uh, uh, but, but clearly, Einstein's whole platform of space-time physics is dead. Thank you. Uh, so I, even though I may, my major was chemical engineering, but I'm still curious about physics science. So I'm here now. But, uh, but as I uh, as I watched your lecture, um, I'm still uh, have a question about that. Replication of uh, quantum in entanglement uh, is uh, s scientific fact <laughs> or truth? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Could, could you interpret that? Uh, what was it? What? No, I, I don't. I don't understand myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 그러니까 이제 그. No, no, that was entanglement is is a prediction. Entanglement is an important prediction of quantum mechanics, and what my experiments and I mean the, my experiments have been repeated many times, literally thousands of times around the world, and they all agree. Quantum entanglement is a very real phenomenon. That's uh, what I think. And at the time, uh, when I did the experiments, uh, nobody cared. Uh, <laughs> and I had great difficulty uh, mustering the resources and the uh, facilities in order to do the experiment. And even after, shortly after, a decade after, I said, ah, you got the results that everybody expected. So what's the big deal? Uh, so it, 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 and it took the, the Nobel Committee 50 years to, to see, gee, maybe this is useful. <laughs> okay, Chat. probably the last one, okay. Um, I'm undergraduate student, so I might not, uh, the question might be very simple, but as the PPT said, um, in lab space, entanglement is impossible. That means the local hidden variable is also valid. Um, well, local hidden variable theories are essentially the simplest formulation of a theory in, in lab space, yes. Yes. Um, does that mean if we are only considering lab space, we can em elaborate the quantum mechanical theories with local hidden variable and might and use it, maybe? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to the second part. It, uh, the, but, but lab space, any lab space uh, formulation of, of any physical theory is effectively dead. Oh, so if you wish to believe it uh, holds quantum mechanical particles. So that, just that's what does that mean me. that lab space is just wrong? Lab space, well, lab space sure appears to be true. But can you, is there, the question, is there a formulation of physics, a physical theory? The, okay, this is basically what Newton, uh, the, the legacy of Newton was that stuff moves around in, in the laboratory coordinates and the, uh, it's governed, the motions and propagations are governed by differential equations. Newton, in order to produce differential equations, well, he first had to invent calculus. But uh, uh, and this was the greatness of, of Newton. But all of everything that he actually, in his legacy was from Galileo, and Einstein was essentially following in the footsteps of all of these men, and they were all trying to formulate, and Einstein trying to formulate physics as stuff moving in lab space, governed by differential equations. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that doesn't appear to be possible. Oh, okay, thank you. And also, there's one simple question. I, ha I've, I know that there's four types of Bell's, in, uh, I mean Bell's states, right? Four total. 
D does your experiment work with all four of them, or all four, of, all f four, or four states of Bell states? I, uh, far as I've learned, there's four um, states of Bell uh, Bell states. Of what? Um, four states. Um, uh, Bell, yes. He's talking about the four Bell states. Yes. Uh, the, the oh, yes. I, okay. Normally, okay. Those are, okay, each for in uh, for the the simplest uh, uh, case, the two particle we have two particles, and each one has two possible results, and so given we have two uh, two particles and two possible results each, that gives you a total of four possibilities. Uh, that you could make. Now it turns out there are ways of formulating Bell's inequality where you actually measure all four uh, possibilities. What the nice thing about the CH inequality is you only need to measure one of the states. You just have, it's a very simple configuration you have for, to test the CH inequality. You have a source of particles, you have an adjustable parameter on, on each experiment, and you have a detector, and that's all you need. So if you just look at the, the coincidence count rates, where both detectors register, uh, and you compare those as a function of the orientation of the analyzers, and then you normalize that on the individual count rates of each detector, independently of each other. That's all you need in order to do the, to test the, the actual CH inequality. So the states of the Bell state does not matter for your experience, right? Uh, yeah, okay. so that one, you, you could, there, you could be uh, anything. So, for uh, example, one of, the, one of the possible states could be spin down, or we didn't see, this, see it at all. So this uh, combi essentially combines the, we didn't see it at all with the spin down state. So, so all we look at is the, is the particles that we did detect. That's what the nice thing about that. 자, 이것으로 클라우저 박사님의 강연을 마치도록 하겠습니다. 여러분 클라우저 박사님께 큰 박수를 부탁드리겠습니다.